Hello, everyone. Um, good afternoon. Welcome to this session on digital inclusion and accessibility. Today, uh, we have a crucial objectives to explore policies, strategies, technologies, and that can promote um, inclusive and accessible digital um, services, especially for people with disabilities. Um, so we aim to address the challenges um, they face and also identify uh, on the ways to bridge the digital divide. Um, throughout this session, we will delve into um, three important key policy questions. First, we will address um, the topics on policies that can be implemented in different regions across the world to ensure that um, technologies and digital services are designed um, inclusively. And second, we will uh, examine strategies to bridge the digital divide, um, empowering people with disabilities rather than uh, marginalism. So lastly, we will explore how training and education programs can really be implemented uh, or uh, as can be more made on accessible and also inclusive to meet um, the needs of people with, with disabilities. So by the end of this session today, um, we hope all participants joining us from on-site and joining us from online uh, will gain a valuable knowledge um, on how um, this really properly include and provide um, systems, digital services, and technologies that really allow all people um, to actively participate and also engage in the digital world. Uh, so, so now, let me introduce our um, panelists and sp uh, speakers who will shed light on these important topics. First, uh, we have speakers from on-site here, um, Judith uh, from the private sector representing the Western Europeans um, group. Uh, so, uh, second, we have um, Gunella from Asia Pacific representing the civil society group. And third, we have from online speakers, Teoros um, so from civil society representing the African group. And lastly, we have um, Denise um, who will be on site here. Uh, representing the private sector, and also from the Latin American and Caribbean group. Um, and we also have from our online speakers, Mohammed Kamran, representing the private sector, Asia Pacific group. So I will uh, give the floor to, to the on-site speakers to introduce themselves. And also I will give the floor to the, our online moderator to introduce our online speakers. Thanks so much, and welcome to everyone coming here. Um, so my name is Judith Hallestein. Although I, I have multiple hats, I do um, have my own firm, Hallestein Associates, and I, besides doing other um, policy and regulatory work, trying to help make um, countries have more effective digital economies, I also do a lot of work on accessibility directly with the U.S. government. I've participated in several of the ITU, uh, the Planning Potentiary, the Council Working Group on Internet Public Policy, and other ones. But here, I am also representing the, uh, the Dynamic Coalition on Accessibility and Disability. We're one of the main Dynamic Coalitions here. We had our session yesterday, um, and I am one of the two co-coordinators here. So I welcome you all to the session. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, I appreciate the invitation to uh, participate uh, in this uh, particular session. And my name uh, is Gonala Astbrink, and I'm based in Australia, but I work globally with uh, as chair of the uh, Internet Society Accessibility Standing Group. And Judith just mentioned the DCAD, the Dynamic Coalition on Accessibility and Disability. And uh, through the generosity of INSERF, we have, um, we have three persons with disability um, able to come to the IGF 
uh, to participate and um, I'm fortunate to be mentoring them in their progress in internet governance. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, now I will give the floor to our online moderator, Marjorie, to introduce our online speakers. Hello. Hello, Saba. Hello, everyone. I'm happy to be here and happy to have you all for this session. Um, um, I'm Gege Marjorie. I'm in Cameroon, Africa. And um, I would like to introduce um, our online speakers. So we have Tiros Eliklim and uh, Mohamed Cameron, who will be talking on the first policy question. Okay. So I would like to give the floor to Fioros now to introduce herself more properly. Yeah, awesome. Thank you, Marjorie. And hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon. And hi from Dawn. Uh, my name is Fioros Eliklim Jineko. I'm Ghanaian, but um, I'm currently a PhD student at Kent State University. Um, just like any of most of our speakers, um, I guess I'll borrow Judith words to say I share many hats. Um, I work with the Ghana Youth in um, Ghana Youth IGF as part of the steering committee member. Uh, I'm currently also part of the um, ISOC alumni network, and um, I do advocacy work in inclusion, in encryption. Uh, and online safety as well. So I'm glad to be here and I hope that we have a fruitful discussion. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Thiero. So that is really, really nice to have you here. So I'll give the floor to Mohammed Kamran. Mohammed, you have the floor. Hello everyone. I hope you all are doing well and uh, uh, my video finds you well. So my name is Mohammed Kamran. I'm from Pakistan and uh, currently I'm in Peshawar. I am a practicing lawyer. I have graduated two years ago and my specialty is criminal law and uh, specifically cyber crimes and such kind of things. With the passage of time day by day, as technology is coming into our lives, the thieves are also getting smarter and cyber crimes and such issues are also increasing day by day. So I have some expertise in that. And IGF, I think, is a platform where we can address such issues, we can find some solutions to that, and also how technology is having effect in our life and also the generation that is coming up next, like after us, how they, it is uh, affecting their lives. So I think being here is going to be fruitful for me and maybe from myself to others as well. Thank you so much for having me. Okay, thank you very much. So um, we're just going to move directly into our first policy question, which is, what policies can, we can be implemented in your region to ensure that technology and digital services are designed and developed to be inclusive and accessible to people with disabilities? So this policy question will be um, addressed by our speakers Theoros and um, Judith, Judith Hellerston. So um, I'll give the floor first to Judith. Hi, thanks so much. So it's, it's actually a combination of policies and also awareness raising. With policies, it, it has to do with, in the, I'm from the US, and in the US, we have the uh, Americans with Disability Act, which works to ensure that things are, uh, that webs uh, other, uh, at least government, right now is all government websites and other websites are accessible for persons with disability. But there's also move working now as an effort to update the act to make sure that websites and other areas are accessible. And with that is the key is the guidelines to be looking at the World Wide Web, the accessibility guidelines. And with that is a series of guidelines on, from the W3C, which is the abbreviation of that. Um, and they work on web content guidelines. There's work on all, all types of publishing of guidelines. It's be, and the key also is, is that you need, everything needs to follow 
um, the WAI, the Weapons Accessibility Initiatives Guidelines, whether it, and especially especially on websites, is the WCAG um, has to be 2.1 or 2.2, and it's a really big problem these lately because. Today, throughout the world, only 3% of the internet is accessible for persons with disabilities, despite there being over 1.3 billion globally and a lot larger. So it's a very big, it's a very big problem since many, and the problem is also um, made more problematic is that companies are not telling developers they need to follow these guidelines. And so developers are not doing it, and then they have to retrofit a system. So the real issue is what you need more is enforcement, that everyone has to follow and make sure that all the sites are at least WCAG 2.1 and either AA, preferably AAA compatible. And if you look at the WAI, um, so it's w3c.org, and if you look at WAI or the WCAG, you can get those, and that is really the key to make them, besides the laws we have, is also on making sure that these are accessible. And there also has an issue of meta tags. So what we, when I say awareness, is that people, when they're creating sites or when they're publishing images or other things, they're not aware that when they take an image and put it, they, that people can't see it. And so when a screen, person using a screen reader comes across that, it'll just say image, or it may say possibly man, possibly with a dog, possibly who, and so all the pictures need to be described and also what PowerPoints or any of these images or some people like to do cut and paste from a document, but when you're cutting and pasting, you're creating an image, and then it makes an accessible document inaccessible. So you have to be aware that you have to save the documents. It's really easy in Word. You could save it and upload it, or links, and the meta tags is really easy. You can just right click on it. So the software is easy to use, is that people are just not aware. Okay, thank you very much, Judith, for that. Um, I would like to, I would like us to now have Fioris's um, opinion about um, the policies that uh, that can be implemented in our region to ensure that technology and digital services are designed and developed to be inclusive and accessible for people with disabilities. So, Fioris, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Marjorie. And um, again, um, I'm grateful for the first speaker because he has, um, she has actually tackled on part of the things that I wanted to say. Um, and so I'm not going to repeat that again. Um, I'm glad she did spoke about um, the platform regulations and how content can be more accessible online as well. Um, so I'm speaking from the African region and um, I'm going to delve more on advocacy work because one of the points that she made, um, which is very real, is the fact that people just don't know that something like that exists. And um, people are not even, I wouldn't, I, I, I wouldn't use the word not interested, but um, people seems to forget that um, not all content is easily accessible by everyone. So even content creators in themselves um, do not make provisions for that. For example, when somebody is creating a YouTube video, um, who are the audiences in mind? And how does the person, for example, make that particular video accessible to everyone? Um, the whole idea is to create um, an almost seamless, um, um, way of consuming content where we don't we don't necessarily have to say this is for able people and this is for disabled people because virtually it's it's just all one humanity so um, the access is very important but advocacy is more important important especially in my opinion because the content creators and the platform moderators um, platform creators sorry are not even aware of 
that mistake. I know um, for um, div Apple devices or even some mobile phones now have um, accessibility options where um, you can have voice over text to help you out or you can um, have an easier way of navigating the, the, um, your, your phone without necessarily being able to see it or hear it or there's a way of that. But again, within the African region, how adoptive is that? How many people are aware of that? How often do we do capacity building and training people to teach people? And the major issue is how many people can afford those devices? We, um, we, we've heard in other sessions and we've had the issue about um, internet accessibility, um, the digital divide, affordance of technology and devices as well. So the question is how many people can even afford um, the mobile devices that have those options? Um, what is the percentage of that? And those who cannot afford those devices, what is the percentage of that? Now, I mean, it's obviously um, those who are in the minority gap of affordance are huge. Now, how do those people still assess content? If they go to the internet cafes in the local communities um, and say, say um, I want to read something on the internet, how, how accessible is that content to them? How do they know about that? And how do we... Um, probably say would handle such a situation as well in our institutions, in our schools, how many schools have um, computer lab that is built to cover that? Those are some of the questions that um, is still, I mean, some of the questions that needs to be explored, but um, overall, the idea is that we, we should come to a middle ground where we bridge the gap, where we don't necessarily have to um, assume that everybody can easily access content online and everybody should be able to understand, everybody should be able to um, afford the whole um, devices that are able to provide accessibility. Um, I'm, I've always stood the whole um, idea or I've always stand on the idea that there shouldn't be any um, clear discrimination or gap um, to necessarily point out that this person is able and this person is not able. Technology in its sense should, should be basic to everybody. Um, and I'm glad you did really spoke um, about the web and how content are tagged. Um, again, I would ask within our African context, and I stand to be corrected on that, but how many of us know that? How many of us know how to meta tag it? I was surprised when you said you can just um, do it in Word and right click. And my question is now we know we can right click and put um, things or meta tags on it, but how many of us know that before this session? How many of us will remember after this session? But if there is any training and capacity building at every level in our schools, perhaps we can get used to doing that and we can know that they are just basic and easy ways of making sure everybody's included. And that's where the advocacy work comes in. That's where the grassroots um, community work comes in. Not that um, just after session speaking, we leave it behind, but after IGF and after various sessions where we speak about bridging these gaps, what do we do after that? Um, I'm going to end here for now and leave the floor, but that's a question that we can think about um, and, and take home and see what each individual can do to contribute. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Theo Rose, for that very insightful um, opinion. So I'll just pass the floor now to Saba on-site moderator for the next um, phase of this. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Marjorie, um, Tioros, and Judith, Judith for your valuable insights on, on, the, question, on the first question. Uh, now let's move to our second policy questions. Um, how can the di digital divide between people with disabilities and those without disabilities be bridged? What strategies can be employed to ensure that technology is used to empower rather than marginalized people with disabilities? I invite um, Gunela joining us from on-site to speak on this uh, question and also Mohammed Kamran joining from online to speak on this question. Over to you. 
Hello. Yes, um, I live in the Asia Pacific region, which we are now in uh, for the IGF. And um, I've been asked to speak s more specifically about activities in this region. And uh, this region is the most populous in the world. Um, it has huge populations, uh, as we know, over one billion. Two little countries in the Pacific that might have 2,000 people, that's it. And the greatest diversity in religion, language, culture and economies. So there's a lot of challenges in this region. And uh, one of the things, though, when it comes to bridging the digital divide is to ensure that mainstream legislation and policy uh, include clauses about accessibility. So it's not that there are separate, separate policies, which are very important, but having them as part of communications acts, uh, communications policy, really does make a difference. And if we take the case in Australia, uh, sure, we have a, a disability, national dis disability strategy that has some key aspects on uh, accessibility um, to uh, communications technologies, but also the Telecommunications Act uh, includes specific provisions there as well. And certainly when it comes to dis disability discrimination legislation. But with all of those cases, implementation has to happen. It's one thing having the policies, but they need to be implemented. And that's really where persons with disability come in to ensure that they are part of a process in helping implement policies. In Australia, there is um, funded through the federal government, and it's actually in the Telecommunications Act, the Australian Communications Consumer Action Network, ACAN. And it, uh, its role is basically to represent consumers and consumers with disabilities in, in, uh, in government, in the private sector, to make sure that there are implementation actions happening in all of those cases. And, and so again, you have consumers generally uh, rep being represented in this body, but specifically persons with disabilities. So there is that cross-fertilization of ideas and strategies and advocacy. And I also wanted to mention the um, public procurement provisions that are uh, in force in a number of countries. It started in the US with something called Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act. And, and it means that governments uh, need to in, include ICT accessibility criteria when they purchase um, anything ICT related. And uh, in Europe, it has um, uh, been harmonized with European standards, and one is called EN 301549, and, and that is talking about user requirements by persons with disability and how to achieve that in public procurement. That has um, been adopted in a number of countries across the world, Kenya, for example, India and Australia. And we want to, we want to see the implementation of that public procurement type of provision. And uh, my, my final point in, in this particular session here uh, is in a mainstream organization uh, to try and make sure that there is an understanding of accessibility and persons with disability and bridging that digital divide. It's, it's really, really important to have accessibility champions, people who have some knowledge of accessibility and work in various or parts of an organization and can remind uh, content developers, um, any uh, tech developers, to make sure that accessibility is included um, as, as particular products are developed. Thank you. Thank you very much for that insight. 
Um, now I will give the floor to Marjorie, uh, and then second question will be also answered by Mohammed joining us from on online. Over to you, Marjorie. Okay, sure. Thank you, Saba. So, um, Mohammed, can you please take the floor? So, how can a digital divide between people with disabilities and those without disabilities be reached? And what strategies can be employed to ensure that technology is used to empower rather than marginalize these people? Okay, thank you, Marjorie, for uh, the question. See, I think technology can help us in many ways, specifically when it comes to the disabled people. It can help us in various ways. Like there are assistive apps, there are assistive devices. Google Assistant is one of the very small example because I think if we include that to other gadgets and to other devices, it can be helpful to us. Coming to the bridging of a technology between the disabled people and others. First of all, I think that disabled people are not only like we cannot call them disabled, but we should call them specially abled. Because if God takes one thing from you, he is going for sure, he's going to give you so many other blessings where he has not blessed with that thing, the normal people, he is going to bless you with that. So I think there are people who are uh, specially abled to bridge the digital divide between people with disabilities and the other people, it is important to normalize the digital platforms and technologies and to make it easily available to everyone. Such digital uh, platforms can include like implementing the feature like uh, screen readers or captioning, adjusting phones, which is available in some apps in some phones, but not everything. And I have used the word normalizing these things. So we have to normalize all these things and we have to make it available as much as we can. Also, by prioritizing accessibility and engaging the disabled people while making these programs and while making these strategies, because if disabled people are a part of the making these policies, these policies will be made so much effective on the ground root level because they're the ones who are the affectees. They know where the lacuna lies and they're the ones who are going to tell us that how we can make strategies they are the, which are the best in ground level. So providing training and resources to individuals with disabilities can also help them navigate and utilize technology very effectively. As I have said earlier, that if we leave it to the people who are the affectees, only then are we going to get the results as much effective as our, like as we need. So yeah, collaborating, the, the one more thing, like it is, I think one of the most important things that collaboration with the technology organizations, like those, uh, uh, those organizations which work for technologies or the uh, government entities and also the disabled organizations or I would say those organizations who works for disabled people. So technology companies and disabled organizations along with the government entities can collaborate while making such platforms while making such programs or policies, I think is going to be one of the very effective ways to bridge the technology between the, uh, the, the disabled people and those who are normal people. So training and education programs to be made very accessible to every one of us, specifically to individuals who are disabled providing alternative formats such as Braille or, or, or audio version and physical assistance to the learning environment should be made very accessible because only physical learning environment and the physical learning environment is going to help them in the best way. Because if, let's say, if a person is blind, so if he sits there in a physical learning environment I think he is going to learn it as 
fast as like none other platform. That is why I have included physical uh, learning environment into my uh, opinions. Incorporating assistive technologies, as I have mentioned earlier, that Google Assistant is also a very uh, effective thing, but we can include such assistive uh, technologies in different gadgets, in different platforms, and to different age, aged people, like Google Assistant is going to work the same for everyone. But if we divide it according to our age groups, for example, what a 10 years old kid will need is different from what a 25 years old person would need. So I think dividing it into age level is also important to me. Offering flexible uh, learning options, such as online courses, et cetera. If someone has no access to physical learning uh, environment, they can be given options with online learning. For example, like we are connecting, connected through online. See, some of us are sitting in Ghana, some I'm in Pakistan, some, some are in Japan. So online connectivity is also very important. Same goes for the disabled people because they're, they're the ones who need us, who need it more than us. Well, oh, Mohamed, thank you. Please round it off now. <laughs> Okay, I'm sorry, I'm taking long, I'm sorry. So yeah, yeah, disabled individuals are to be involved in designing all these uh, policies. My last point would be, as I've mentioned earlier, that while designing each and every policy and program, we need to consult these people because they are the, they're the ones who are affected. So they are the ones who are going to give us the policies which are like effective in the, on the ground. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mohamed. That was very insightful. I, I learned a lot about it and many things that I don't even know about. So um, I think we can move now to our next policy question. That is policy question three. So um, Saba, we have Denise there already. You're welcome, you. Denise. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So, Thank you. Thank you very much, Marjorie. Um, now, uh, I really want to give the floor now to Judy to share on the uh, trainings and also what kind of education programs can really ma be made to accessible uh, and inclusive to meet the needs of people with disabilities. So um, I would like to give the floor to, Ju to Judith to answer this question. And please, if you have any comments or if you have any questions, feel free to raise your hand from here. And for, for online participants, you can also put in the chat and Marjorie will take one of that. Um, uh, Judith, over to you, please. And also, please, um, at the end, um, you can also raise about your key takeaways and also recommendations on all of those topics. Sure, thanks so much. Uh, and I'm, thank you for giving me the floor. I am going to be leaving shortly afterwards because I have, uh, I'm organizing a, another the 530 session on policy network on meaningful connectivity. So I, ha so I apologize, I have to run out afterwards. But one of the key on the training and education programs, the key is that programs should, needs to be designed to make accessible to all. And a lot, I know a lot of places like to use a lot of pictures and descriptions, but then all these pictures need to be described because otherwise the person with disability are not getting anything out of them. We had a, a, a perfect example of uh, one of our disability fellows who was using, who, had, who had created a special bla braille keyboard um, in India for STEM education. Uh, and so there are, it, you need to have a lot, you need to rethink the, the sessions and what you're trying to gain out of it. And so that way you could actually address all the people and everyone can benefit from the same sessions. So like if you use pictures, you really have to describe them. If you use diagrams, you have to describe them because otherwise the person is not going to be able to get there and they'll get frustrated and they'll drop off. Um, and if you really want to have people to be active in it, they need to feel part of the whole conversation and part of the learning and they need to partner with it. So that is really the key is that you need to have you need to rethink how you're going to do online education or in-person education to focus on how you're going to meet the needs. 
And there's also the problem is, is that there are many different needs. You have person with visual disabilities, you have person with hard of hearing, um, and then you have person with cognitive disabilities. And so each one is very different and has a different approach. So there's no one, um, there's no one thing fits all approach. You need to have tailor the approach to, to the actual group. And so that way you can really address all their issues. With a cognitive one, you have to also make sure that it's not too many images or not too, or the pictures is not taking up the whole screen because they cannot deal with all the pictures while maybe a hard of hearing person will want that. So you really have to work with who is the community you're trying to address and then figure out how you're gonna address it and how you're gonna meet the needs of those. So that's sort of what one goal you have in mind in there. And the other one is um, make sure everything is accessible. Make sure that the platform that you're using is accessible. Oftentimes people think the platform is, or the, play, or the company said, oh yes it is, but it really isn't. And so the key is often to get these programs be audited and tested by another company who's in that business to audit and test them and to make sure they are actually accessible. Um, because so many programs say they are, and it could be that individually the components are, but when put together in the actual program, it no longer is accessible. So that's why it's the key to have accessibility testers and have a firm who's audited that. The enforcement is the key. Places say, oh yes, we'll do it, oh yes, but then it may have been initially, but then as they added more a newer material, they didn't keep up those standards. And then the whole program becomes inaccessible. So I would say that's my takeaway, is to make sure that you have an online program tested by an accessibility firm to make sure that it actually works and that there is no, and that pictures are described, everything is described and appropriately meta tagged so that people can be reading it and seeing it. And now I have to uh, run off to my, so sorry, but uh, Gunala has my information and she can direct any questions, or probably also answer any of them. Thank you, thank you very much, Judith, for your insightful. Um, now, now I will give the floor to, Deni to uh, Denise to answer on, on how trainings and educational programs can be made more accessible and inclusive to meet the needs of people with disabilities. Den Denise, first introduce yourself and answer. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I am Denise Leal from Brazil. I am here uh, to represent Latin American Caribbean people. I belong to the private sector and academia, and I am also part of the Youth Latin American Caribbean IGF. Uh, and I was part, I am a farmer fellow from the youth program of Brazil. And you might be thinking, why am I here speaking on the topic? I was also a volunteer and a teacher in the inclusion program in Brazil in uh, Pontifical University of Goiás. And we work there with elderly and also people with disability. I had some experience in the topic then. So uh, answering this question, um, before answering this question, I wanted to say that I am very happy because we have this session, because we are giving voice to this topic, to this theme. It's really important. It's a thing that we need to do more often. And I wish we had more participation on the topic and that the IG community really uh, could get more involved on it. And for beginning, when we talk about training and education programs and how, how they can be made more accessible and inclusive to meet the needs of the people with disabilities, I think that 
first of all, we need to give space and voice to the people with disability to speak about uh, their situations, how they feel, and what are their needs. Because sometimes, um, very often, we don't really give a space to them to speak about their needs, or we don't have patience enough to listen to them speaking, because we think that, oh, they speak in a different way, or they hear in a different way. We must be patient when a person without disability sees and listens to a person with disability, sh the person really needs to be heard at that point, and we need to give space and voice and a power to these people to say what are their needs. And uh, we, of course, we need policies on the topic, but also we need people to understand the policies. In Brazil, we have almost 15% uh, of the population we, we, uh, as a person with disability, so it's a large amount of people, it's not a small number. It's In Latin America, it's 85 million of people with disability, and therefore we need to work on policies to make um, training and education programs more accessible, not only the online one, but also the online one, but also the on-seat. Uh, schools need to be more accessible, and when it gets to the technology topic and internet topic, uh, what we have seen in Latin America is uh, people with disability are getting space on social media to speak, and it's nice. When it comes to internet, the social media is um, having a, a paper, a, a work uh, on, the, on the topic. They are occupying spaces on uh, internet, and it's nice, and we need to also moderate more the social media because I have seen some cases where in Latin America people with disability have suffered bullying, online bullying, online hate for speaking uh, about their lives and their problems, their issues. Therefore, what we need, uh, of course, our colleague has spoken really well on the topic that we need training, online training, online platforms that are really accessible, but also, we need to moderate the uh, social media, the websites, so that we don't have uh, people with disabilities suffering in these spaces from all the kinds of uh, problems that they could suffer in online spaces. I also believe that uh, technology is plays a huge role on the topic, helping people to get more connected, to learn more, to... I have a friend that has spoken on the Youth Latin American Caribbean IGF, and he's, he's today a lawyer, and he is a person with disability. He uh, is able to be a lawyer because today in Brazil, this, the legal system is almost everything online, works online, so he, he is able to use the online platform, the technology, to help him in his legal activities. So today, he is uh, in a high, uh, he has high education, he has studied and he's planning to go for a master degree because of technology on education in Brazil education. I also wanted to highlight uh, in, an important point, which is, we have in Brazil only 14% of people in going for uh, higher levels of education. So it's a really small number, 14 people of all the uh, people with disability. So it's a really, really small number. And also there is a wage gap of almost 25% less for people with disabilities in terms of salaries. So it's so unfair. And the law is, uh, the law talks about it, we cannot have wage gap of salaries, but it is a reality. So we have policies on the TEM, we have laws on the TEM, but how can we make them uh, a reality, a practical reality? We must, how is the accountability of the TEM, of, of the topic? So I wanted to 
leave you with the ans these answers and also these questions. And I hope that in the next years, in the next IGFs, we have more involvement on the theme, on the topic, and we have even more people with disabilities speaking and occupying spaces. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Denise, for your valuable inputs. Um, so far, we have um, been discussing on um, implementing policies that really prioritize um, inclusive and accessible design on using um, technology and also digital services, especially considering the diverse needs of, of, of people that are with disabilities. Um, you also talked about the need to develop a training um, in support programs to enhance the, the literacy digital literacy, um, and also the assistive technology skills um, for, pe for people uh, with disabilities, and also offering ongoing technical, technical support to address um, the accessibility challenges have also been mentioned as well. Um, and bridge, bridging the digital divide uh, also has been mentioned by, access, by providing um, accessible access affordable accesses to um, some devices and also internet connectivity, uh, creating accessible digital content and also um, some of the tailored digital literacy programs as well. Um, we have also been discussing on fostering collaboration um, among different stakeholders um, to promote the digital inclusion and raising awareness and advocacy have also been mentioned for the rights and needs uh, of those people in the digital realm. Now I will give the floor to, um, to any questions or comments uh, from, from on site, and also um, please feel free to share your comments and questions in the chat, and Marjorie, our online moderator, will take it from there. Hi, everyone. I'm Joelson Dias from Brazil. I represent here the federal council, uh, the federal bar of the, the Brazilian Bar Association, although at this moment I'm speaking on my personal capacity. Well, I see this very empty room, regrettably, which means to me that we have this big challenge on including persons with disability. We talked a lot about inclusion in this conference about women, indigenous people, and so on, which is quite important, of course, but it looks like the challenge to include persons with disabilities is even bigger. Well, I have a brief statement and two questions to the panelists. I'd like to express my sincere appreciation to the sponsor organizers and organizations for hosting this crucial panel on the inclusion for people with disabilities. The insights from the panelists have been deeply insightful, emphasizing the complexity, dimensions of digital accessibility. The internet serves as a gateway for many to find partners, jobs, and purchase products, ensuring that apps and platforms are designed to allow persons with disabilities to have the same opportunities. is not just about technical accessibility, but also inclusivity in content and user experience. In this regard, I have the first question. Given the diverse types of disabilities and the unique challenges which presents in the digital space, how can we ensure that our efforts in digital inclusion are not just broad, but also deep, addressing the specific needs of each disability type? Additionally, how can we foster a collaborative environment where governments, businesses, and individuals work hand in hand to drive meaningful change in digital accessibility. And finally, in addition to technical accessibility, how can we ensure that the content and functionalities of digital platforms are inclusive, allowing persons with disabilities to fully engage in online activities, such as dating, job hunting, and shopping? What strategies can be employed to ensure that digital content is both accessible and relevant to their needs? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that question. Now I will give the floor to Gunel to answer on the first question and second question. Maybe Tioros, um, if you can add on that one. Thank you. Uh, yes, there was a lot in those two questions. I will 
probably start by addressing one aspect in your second question and relating to employment. And that is a huge issue. And I will uh, refer to um, uh, Vidya Y, who is uh, a DCAD Disability Fellow here at the IGF. And uh, she is blind and she uh, finished her high school education with a gold medal. And she was the only one of her cohort who didn't get a job at the end. And, and she has done a degree in computer science, etc. So she started her own organization because she's, she's a, very, uh, a very strong woman. But uh, the percentages of people with disabilities who have employment is far, far too low. And what, what is happening in some countries like Sri Lanka and Australia is uh, that there are organizations training both persons with disability in marketable um, jobs. And, but as well as that, raising awareness in companies that may employ those people and being part of the interview process, being mentoring there for a, 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 a number of months as a person joins the workforce. So that process really does make a difference and it's been quite successful, but it's long term. And, and it's again this thing about employers understanding that uh, a person with a disability um, isn't a liability. They are not a liability. People with disabilities uh, have proven by many studies um, to be very, um, very loyal employees, very consistent in their work, and, and uh, there might be some accommodations needed in their workplace, but it's to raise that awareness of how it can be achieved. So I, I might pass it on to if anyone else wants to have a say on that question. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe Tioros, if you can add on the second yes. question and then we proceed to other one. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, I'll try to make my answer very brief actually so we could have more questions in there. But um, just on a quick one, um, I, I should, I, I agree with um, the person that asked the question because this is um, more like, an, I wouldn't say very important than the other sessions, but this is a critical topic. And <laughs> when he said that the room was empty, it's like, I saw the camera going on, I was like, well, yeah. Um, and it's always the challenge that we face that um, we talk about inclusion and yet um, we don't include the people who need to be included. So it's more like um, trying to, solve somebody else's problem without having the person there to um, give you the whole um, idea of that. But that notwithstanding, um, I do agree with uh, my earlier speaker, um, making the whole, uh, I agree with her point on the idea that um, the, the, the people with disability have equal right and um, are equally committed to their work. Um, just like how we uh, able people are also committed. Now, the first question is on how to address specific needs. Um, in, all, in, in all honesty, to address somebody's need, you have to speak to the person. Uh, it's easier being an able person saying you need to build a platform, you need to do this um, without necessarily talking, out, talking to the disabled people. So again, I'll come back to the whole idea of speaking to people who need the help and asking them how they want to help. It's always better to speak to them to tell her, uh, device, not devices, but to tell her innovations and to tell her building ideas around what they want and not what we assume they, they want. So it's always needed to have them included in every discussion we do as well. Um, there's also another question on collaboration. How does government and other people collaborate? Well, I, I don't know if this is a simple answer, but there has to be collaboration. So reaching out to them, um, I know in, in Ghana, for example, we have an organization called Inclusive Tech um, being uh, um, owned by um, Dr. Millicent. She herself is um, disabled. She usually or mostly have hackathons for disabled people, training them 
um, in innovation, building technology. That's just one thing. I'm sure other countries have similar things as well. If we could collaborate with government or civil servant or get funding to do all those things um that should help and in my last part of concluding on this point as well um how do we create content again i'll come back to my first point let's ask the people what type of content they want if they can be involved yeah i'm sure that there are a lot of um challenged disabled people sorry who are computer science people they know how to build the app why don't we give them the opportunity to do that i guess that will help Thank you. Hello, Theoros. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Theoros. Um, since we are also running out of time, um, maybe for, for the next questions. Okay. Okay. Um, so we have a question from on site, and I will give the floor to uh, Veronica. Hello. Can you hear me well? Um, hello everyone, my name is uh, Veronica, I'm Italian and uh, I'm the chair of the Internet Society Youth Standing Group. Um, thank you first of all for uh, you know, bringing the topic of disability uh, to the IGF and um, I don't actually have a question, I have a comment um, because uh, I would actually like to bring my own experience um, when I was uh, a child, uh, due to um, an infection, I lost uh, between uh, the 30 and 70 percent of my uh, of my you know, hearing ability. Um, and for me, uh, the interaction since I was a child has always been very difficult, especially uh, with people that have you know, very low tone, tone of voice. So I always have to, um, to ask them to repeat what they say. And hearing uh, your, uh, your uh, panel, your intervention, I think that is something that is lacking and this granularity of approach because not all disability are the same and not all of them have to be treated like that. Um, for example, in my experience, I uh, don't have full hearing capacity uh, and the interaction in, in, in person for me is always very difficult. In order to hear your intervention, I always have to read the subtitle. So for me, you know, those type of uh, um, um, auxiliary instrument for me are very helpful. And on the other hand, uh, I, had to ha I had to give a lighting talk uh, the other day where this instrument was not actually available. And for me, it was very difficult to understand people who were uh, talking at the microphone. And just for you to say that sometimes also uh, digital tools are very helpful. I have a better interaction online than I have uh, that, uh, that compared to the interaction I have on site or in presence. So uh, what I would like also to, uh, to um, you know, um, invite you to consider is also that digital tools can be uh, a, an amazing tool to help people with, uh, with disability. My uh, is de facto a disability, but it's not recognized uh, in, uh, in any way, because in order to be uh, recognized as a disabled person, each, each country has its own parameters. So it's not always simple, you know, uh, to uh, to get access to um, how to say aid to on uh, on this. Uh, so yes, this one. Thank you very much, Veronica, <coughs> for your comment. And next, please. Uh, hello, this is Umar Khan uh, from Pakistan. Uh, I will leave some disappointment um, with, to second the Brazilian guy and some statistic from Pakistan as well uh, with regards to the person with disabilities. These empty chairs in the room show the seriousness toward the inclusion of the digital literacy for the people with dis uh, disabilities. So I think uh, these rooms should have been more crowded than ever. We also have seen very least number of people with disabilities somehow some disability in the IGF. Um, during the Kyoto uh, International Conference Center. So this also shows that uh, the actual people with the disabilities 
with the inclusion of them in any field, especially in the internet, this is somehow a disappointment. And I think uh, the IGF should take it very serious. Uh, if I just come to the statistic of my country, uh, my friend, my class fellow, and my college colleague is also on the panel, Mohammed Kamran. I'm so happy for him to be here on the panel. Pakistan having a population of around 236 million population, and in which 6% of the population is somehow uh, with disability, physically or mentally. But it's also a disappointing moment that only 37% of the population uh, among the 236 million are using internet. The journal public, only 37% of the internet users are in the population. So you can guess, you can observe that a country having 236 million population, having just 37% of the internet user, how will you take or how will you notice the people with disabilities? So I think uh, IGF should really work and the technical, the companies, and the civil society should be more serious. And I'm hopeful that we can see some good number of people with disability next year in IGF happening anywhere. So I'm hopeful for that. Thank you. Thank you very much for that comment and questions. Um, now I will give the floor to our speakers on site and online to give their final remarks or um, final words, and also they can address on the comments and also the questions asked. Um, I will give the floor to the speakers and please make it very brief, up to 30 seconds, over to you. Thank you very much. Yes, in, uh, in regard to the gentleman from Pakistan, I totally agree with you. And uh, we, we need to have more persons with disability attending because the disability community's motto is nothing about us without us. We need to be here. I have a disability. Uh, we need more people who represent uh, our own voices. And I would strongly suggest that you write to the IGF secretariat, uh, to, um, to the MAG, to express your disappointment that there aren't enough persons with disability here. The IGF secretariat has a funding program, uh, but it still isn't enough people with disability coming here. And just one short point is we have, um, as the accessibility standing group, a training program on persons with disability uh, in digital rights and internet governance. And uh, paired with the DCAD, the Dynamic Coalition on Accessibility and Disability, um, we have a small amount of funding to bring people here, but we need so much more. So thank you very much for that point. Hi, I would like to thank you for your participation and questions. Uh, I was a little bit worried since we didn't have lots of participation, but we had questions, comments, and online questions also. It's really an important point, and uh, well, thank you, Veronica, for what you have said. Have you have you spoken to us? It's the same in Brazil about uh, how it's sometimes difficult to recognize the disability of a person, and most importantly, most imp when the person doesn't have a disability which is visual, with e which you can easily see, the person suffers a lot of prejudice and doesn't have her rights recognized immediately. So it's important that you say to others and that we talk about it because we also have this, these disabilities that we cannot see. But we must recognize their existence, that they, that these people also need somehow help and somehow uh, to be recognized as people with disabilities. And thank you for the Brazilian, the another Brazilian person here, I don't remember your name, Joelson, I think. Yes, thank you for being here and for your comment. I think that it's actually difficult, hard, your question. What, are, what strategies are both accessible and relevant? How can we make the online content 
more inclusive? Well, we have ways to make it, but also, do we have the economic interest in making it? Uh, and also, I think that this qu this answer and this question goes aligned with the question from my other friend, uh, the other lawyer here from Pakistan, uh, about the technical and infrastructure aspects uh, for uh, internet. Uh, I think that we have an example in Brazil, a successful e example of the indigenous and traditional communities where they couldn't have access to internet so that the community itself organized an internet and a local internet. So maybe uh, in the case of people with disability and other minorities, um, maybe the answer is the communities itself, not the disability, the people with disability com community, but other co minorities and local communities could be the answer to it. But we have to mobilize and to make these peoples understand the needs of the, all these minorities and communities. In the case of the indigenous, they could make it because they were all located in the same place. But how can we make it? How can we make our small communities and minorities work together to find a, an infrastructure solution? I believe it's possible. But we have to work harder on showing it to people. As you have all noted and told us and is spoken about it, we don't have that much people here. We should have a crowded room, but we don't have. So we must mobilize more people and have more space and voice to talk about these situations so that we can have a better infrastructure and technology for people with disability. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank uh, you very much, Denise. Now I will give the floor to Mar Marjorie to um, to take the floor to our speakers um, to for their final remarks or um, recommendations or any key takeaways. Okay, thank you very much, Saba. So uh, we have Fioros and Mohammed remaining, and um, I'll just please like that also we include our online participants. So I'll read out their questions, and then while you are addressing, give me your final remarks, you're just going to touch on them, please. So um, this is from Joseph Committee. He said, why we make systems and apps as well as content online accessible to people with disabilities? What policies can be implemented to protect abusive content against people with disabilities online because there is some kind of stigmatization, especially on social media. This is from Joseph, IGF Ghana, Hope. And then we have the next, can our world truly progress if we continue to build barriers that exclude people with disabilities or should we unite to break down these obstacles to create a more inclusive future? So um, maybe Theoros, you can start, thank you. Uh, um, great. So um, again, I'm 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 going to try as much as possible to keep it very short and all of that. Now, um, in terms of policies and stigmatization, I mean, this real stigmatization is real in every sector, but I guess it's worse for um, for the one with um, worse for people with disability because again, um, some of the things that Veronica said and as all our speakers keep saying over and over again is that some of the disabilities are not like um, visually it's not visual for you to see and the mistake we keep doing all the time is to try to group everything as one so this is what i, I would say um that uh, um policy takes time but the question is we even need to know if we have policy such policies for example um i i, I would not really say ghana we do have or not because honestly i've not done digital research on that and i would not want to say that on authority but it will be a good thing a good thing to find out if we do have one um how accessible is that um how how are, are people even aware of such a policy is there a common knowledge um that we have to do in terms of stigmatization is i guess it, it would still stem from education teaching people um that people with disabilities are human and there's no problem with that and we are okay and everything is fine it's a good thing to um start with and as i conclude i just want to take the time to just even say thank you to everyone um we hope that this session had extended more uh but i'll leave my email in the chat feel free to um, um suggest any project any capacity building 
student training. Um, this is not just a one time of discussion. It could be some, something that continues and hope that next year, once we have um, discussion on the same area, we have a more fuller room and we have people who would really, really want to um, tell and probably share what they have been going through and how we can basically build content around them as well but I will still stand on my first point at the beginning that advocacy is always key advocacy never ends it start um, but it's a continual process and I hope that we all take that in and thank you so much and I'll hand over to Karma thank you um your please 30 seconds Muhammad <laughs> thank you okay so thank you so much everyone and I hope all the answers uh, all the questions have already been answered and uh, as far like what uh, what we can do for implementing these ideas. I was just like, we have talked in detail about, in details about all of these things, but I'm going to add one more thing. We said that government should do this and we should do this and that. But one more thing that I want to add here, why after seeing the situation in the hall, in the room right now, that the people with disabilities needs to also address their issue. Like we are not going to be like we are not only be the ones who are going to talk about that, but they are going to make us talk about all this. Like this empty room is an example that maybe they're not interested to be a part of all this. So they have to be interested, and we have to, uh, yeah, we have to be organizing some conferences or some awareness sessions to educate them so that they can come up and talk about their disabilities. So uh, I think we have talked about all the aspects possible in a very short span of time. And I'm sorry if I have left anything and I'm thank you. I'm thankful to all of you for having us here, for letting us speak. And uh, I hope to see all of you so in some other tomorrow. Thank you thank so much. You, thank you very much. Yes, sir, I have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so we have come to the end of our session now, and I would like to thank our speakers, um, our panelists for their valuable inputs and also contributions. Indeed, um, your experts, expertise and also insights has been really tru um, truly enlightening. And um, what I would like to say is um, let's all together continue our efforts to ensure um, the inclusivity and accessibility in digital technologies and, and in digital services. Um, so thank you all for attending our today's session, from joining us from on-site or joining us from online, and we hope um, you found this very informative and thought-provoking. Um, and yeah, remember that your involvement is really crucial on creating um, a more inclusive future for all, for all persons. Have a wonderful day. Thank you so much.